everybody, and great opportunity to talk about these lovely little birds. We're going to touch on, on budgies and cockatiels and uh, canaries and a few other bits and pieces. Um, so let's get cracking. Um, of just, you know, of the, the main focus here is budgies and cockatiels, um, and they are, without doubt, the most commonly kept pet birds. Obviously, we know that budgies are, are small in size, but have a tremendously big personality, um, and I think, quite honestly, are vastly underrated by many vets and keepers, and it's all about getting a budgie that's young enough and then spending enough time with it, and uh, as we were discussing beforehand, Anthony, they can be the most marvelous uh, pets, particularly for older people, um, and, and I've known many budgies that, that talk and, uh, you know, it really interacts in a big, big way with their owners, so very, very popular. They've been bred in captivity since 18. Uh, 100, so uh, we've been doing it a long time. They're sexually mature at six months, but they can produce semen at 90 days, so they're, they're pretty uh, up for it at a young age. Um, and of course, we have to remember they are adapted for arid, to live in an arid dwelling. So uh, you know they are Australian desert living birds, and, and that does that is relevant when we come to think about therapeutics, which we'll discuss at the end. Um, Unlike other citizens, they are typically parent-reared, and, and that's a really positive thing. Um, we're, we're not going to discuss today, uh, but we have previously the, the problems created by hand-rearing, um, and, and in budgies that doesn't happen, so, so that's good. They tame down very quickly, um, so uh, from that point of view, hand-rearing isn't required, and I say the key thing is you get them when they're young. Typically, they're about seven inches long, weighing 35 to 75 grams. Now, the point here is that the traditional Australian budgie is just 35 grams, whereas the English show budgie is about 75, 80 grams. So, uh, we have bred them big and special, should we say? Um, but the traditional guys are, are, are really cute. Lifespan is six to ten years. Uh, that, that's common, um, but uh, maximum has gone up to 18 years, so they can live a, a really good long time. And of course, they naturally flock dwelling in Australia, as I say, living in, de in deserts, and that means that we cannot use in-water medication, guys. Big take-home message number one, no Batril in the water for your budgies, sorry. Okay, so very active in the wild, they scurry around from food source to food source, eating predominantly native grass seeds, um, and, and of course the key thing here is that grass seeds are much lower in fat compared with millet, which tends to be the main staple diet of, of most budgies in captivity. So here we have a, a, a typical flight of budgies, obviously a flight outside by, by a budgie enthusiast rather than an individual pet bird. Um, it's important to understand that in any exotic animal disease situation, about 75% of all diseases are said, uh, cliche perhaps, but they are said to be associated with poor husbandry or or management, um, and so we've always got to remember, um, you know, not only how is the bird kept in captivity, but also how would the bird naturally live in the wild, because it's typically the contrast between one and the other, which is the underlying cause of most diseases, so things like obesity, atherosclerosis, lipomas, liver disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, all tend to be linked to the difference between natural living and the, the captive living that most people provide. Male budgies are for, certainly far better mimics compared with females, a common factor in, in many bird species, um, and budgies are generally sexually dimorphic when they're mature. Obviously, we're familiar with the blue sear of a male budgie, uh, which can, of course, turn brown uh, to the, the brown color of a female, uh, and in that situation, often associated with a systole cell tumor of the testicle, of course. So here we have a, a typical male budgie with a nice, bright uh, blue sear, uh, and here we have a male budgie which, whose sear is, is predominantly brown, and this, this sear actually is what we refer to as brown sear hypertrophy, um, and, and that is associated with hormonal changes. Moving on to cockatiels, uh, they're usually pulled from the nest at two to three weeks of age and then hand reared, and they're tiny wee things with no feathers at that stage, so quite delicate um, rearing required. Uh, having said which, they're not fussy birds to rear, they can be commercially reared on any um, good quality uh, commercial available, commercially available hand rearing food, um, obviously fed at the right consistency and temperature, uh, and that's really, really important when rearing any young birds. Adult male grey birds have bright orange facial patches, and females don't, so that's nice and easy uh, with, with the grey birds. Um, and adult males have solid colored flights and tails. If you look underneath the, the flight feathers, but particularly underneath the tail feathers, the male birds have a solid color, whereas the females tend to have bars or on some occasions spots. Adult pearl and pied pearl 
birds are sexually monomorphic, so, so with those we can't differentiate uh, between the sexes. Male cockatiels, like budgies, are good mimics. They will whistle and talk well, whereas the, the females will vocalize and whistle a little, but do not talk. Um, and uh, young, young males uh, are certainly uh, much more vocal. Um, canaries were initially imported into Europe by Spanish sailors from the Canary Islands, bred in captivity since the 17th century, uh, and kept for singing, um, that's the male birds, for color, um, or for confirmation, uh, and, and have been uh, bred and showed uh, as such as that. Of course, we all know from a historical point of view that canaries were used by miners for detection of carbon monoxide, and that just reminds us um, of uh, the, the uh, great uh, potential gas exchange system that uh, uh, all birds have in their lung system. Canaries are colorful, they're popular, and, and of course, they're reasonably priced birds, so uh, and from that point of view, for an elderly person, often uh, very suitable. Other small cage and aviary birds to consider, lovebirds, they're active, busy birds, but it has to be one of the greatest misnomers ever. Lovebirds are certainly not love, they, they are very often aggressive and, and, uh, uh, and can cause significant trauma to each other. But they're cheeky, they tease, they have a sense of humor, uh, and they are commonly kept as pets. Uh, there are other small parrots and parakeets, parrotlets that we should consider uh, that's, that fall into the category of small cage and aviary birds such as Senegal parrots, mares, cakes, parakeets such as grass, linolated, grey-cheeked, ring-necked, torcosines, and, and the conures. And each individual species has its own personality as a general rule of thumb. Um, and, and I have to say that I, my preference would be uh, nowadays to keep uh, a lot of these smaller birds uh, rather than the, the larger parrots such as the, the greys, the cockatoos, and the amazons. Um, and so all of the above can be treated in a similar way to budgies and cockatiels, and certainly from a disease control point of view, fit into the, the same sort of category. When looking at birds in the practice, it's essential to recognize your species to make sure your receptionists take the species so that uh, you're aware of it before you get to see it. And I just give this as an example. This is a Pekin robin. It's obviously an insectivorous bird. Uh, some people might think it looks a, a little bit similar to, to some of the other birds we've been talking about. The key, of course, is the beak. It's a, an obvious insectivore's beak rather than a, a gramnivorous bird. Um, and of course, the key thing is if you were hospitalizing this bird, it does not eat millet. It needs an insectivorous bird. So knowing your bird, that your species is really important. Overall, we've got more than 9,000 species of bird. They vary in size, diet, method of ambulation, region of origin. There's a vast diversity of care required for them. And uh, as I said before, the, the, the crucial thing is to try and look after them in much the same way as they would uh, live naturally in the wild anyway. Um, so uh, just to reinforce again, remember, find out the species of species, the species of bird that you're going to be consulting before it comes into your consulting room. So let's move on to think about the recognition of ill health. And of course, it, it's uh, important to stress that birds are prey species. They hide the signs of illness for as long as possible. And it's therefore important that we help our clients to recognize the signs of ill health as soon as possible. That may be by giving client lectures, posters in the reception area, newsletters, and so forth, um, so that the client recognizes the sick bird straight away. And of course, when they call you in the practice, it is essential that sick bird is seen the same day. You know, a sick bird cannot wait until tomorrow. Um, as I said, they hide the signs of illness. They have a higher metabolic rate. So a sick bird gets sicker and dies quicker than, than any mammal would. So important they are seen the same day. It's good to get your receptionist trained so they know to advise the client to bring the bird in in its own cage, not cleaned out. Uh, and that means that we can actually examine the cage and learn a lot just in, in, in terms of what we can see in the cage. Do be very cautious and aware of the potential for a bird to become scared in the waiting room. Uh, any, any sick bird sitting in a cage, particularly at ground level, uh, with cats, ferrets, dogs, rodents, or hawks, uh, is a major additional stress and certainly is going to have a negative effect on the prognosis. So we need, as, as clinicians, to set aside quality time outside routine consulting hours to see our birds. Bird consults will generally take longer, and clients should be expected to pay a realistic fee for the time that we put into it. Speed does matter in terms of making a diagnosis with all avian patients. And when we're dealing with small cage and avian birds, the eternal conundrum is, what does the client want? 